Hey guys, Jason Shellcross coming to you live again from quarantine land. <laughs> Alex and I have a great episode lined up for you today. We're going to be talking about The Last Dance. How could we not on a fantasy football podcast? We're also going to be talking a little bit about the Steelers. And where should you draft Lamar Jackson this year? Or should you not? Stay with us. Welcome to the Fantasy Football Sackos Podcast with your hosts, Jason Shalcross and Alex Krog. All right, here we go. Welcome, episode two, Fantasy Football Sackos. Alex Krogh, Jason Shawcross, back at you again here with episode two of the Fantasy Football Sackos. Welcome, everyone. Alex, my man. Jason, Jason, congratulations. We did not cancel ourselves. <laughs> we, no, we are still yeah, we, that We made bored. it through episode one. <laughs> We're trying episode two. There's been fives and tens of people that have listened to us. Uh, Thank you. Ride. Thank you to all of our fans. <laughs> yeah, no, you, yeah, you can leave the S off probably. Um, it's just but, my mom at this point, I think. Uh, yeah, our, our my fiance gave it a shout. She told me to stop interrupting you. So I'm going to try and give you that, uh, that respect this episode. We'll see. Hopefully I get a better review from the significant other <laughs> at the end of this. Yeah, somebody, somebody commented that you have like the voice of Fergie in G or something like that. I don't know about that. My mother always told me I had a face for radio, though, so I think I'm on the right track here. Yeah, why Why are we recording this and putting it on YouTube? I don't know. I mean... You look terrible. Absolutely. I'm a little better off, a little more clean cut than you are, given the situation. We also had a reviewer say that you looked like the red-headed version of Jesus, which... If we can turn that into a bit somehow, I think we're on the right track. But hey, hey all right, ladies and gentlemen, yeah. you're gonna have to go to YouTube to see what just happened. But uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, one of my cousins texted me. He's like, "Yeah, you do kind of look like Andy Dalton, but he uh, has a hundred more million dollars than you." <laughs> Is that all? Is that all it takes? I guess, yeah. Oh I guess that gosh. means you're successful or something. I don't know, or a professional quarterback that gives millions of dollars to charity a year. Right, right. That, yes, exactly. Yeah. There's worse things. He could have called you many worse things than Andy Dalton, but he has. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I would like to uh, formally thank all of our listeners. I know that we've had several people listen on many different platforms. We are available wherever you listen to podcasts, I hope. Uh, on, now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, should be on TuneIn, Google Podcasts. We're trying to hit all of the bases here. Um, but uh, again, thank you to anybody that tuned into our first video. Obviously, we weren't deterred enough and we decided to come back for more punishment. So let's get into we're, it. We're, yeah, we're basically Michael Jordan in the 80s, I think. We're <laughs> losing to the Pistons, but eventually we're going to be the greatest of all time. You wait. Now, topical. Let's let's get into it. Last night, see our episodes nine and ten of The Last Dance. I see you're repping our Chicago Bulls here with the 96 champions hat. What did you think? Yeah, 96 champs, uh, still the greatest team of all time because uh, as the Warriors learned uh, going 73 and 9, it don't mean a thing if you ain't got that ring. Suck it. <laughs> Sorry, Kevin Durant. Oh, <laughs> man, we're, all, we're out here. Yeah, we're coming. Uh, so, yeah, the, the last dance was so good. I can't even begin to just the the producer putting some cutscenes together, flashing back to the, the thing that really got me. And it's so weird, but it's like Steve Kerr, his dad died. And he's like, yeah, I, I, you know, I think about my dad during the national anthem. I had no idea. And the, no, I, I did not know that that was even a None. thing. But then it flashes forward and it, the national anthem's playing during like the finals and it's and it screens out and Steve Kerr's standing there potentially thinking about it like, yeah. yeah, it was it was just fantastic. Some of the cutting was amazing. I mean, yeah. Did you watch a lot of the Bulls when you know in the '90s? I mean, for me, I was born in '89 and I was born in the fall, so late '89. And so, like their first run of 
three peats like I have no recollection of. And not only that, but my dad was not a very big NBA basketball fan or any basketball at all for that matter. And so it just wasn't something that we really had on a lot at home. Um, I do remember that when they were going for their second three-peat, my dad, who I know is like, since then, since late nineties Bulls, I can confidently say he has not watched another Bulls game. <laughs> Confidently, well, besides the fact that they were terrible for years and somebody made the joke that they've been rebuilding since 1998, but I'm not going to, I'm going to leave that alone. Yeah, I think that, right, exactly. That, that was how the doc end. They began their rebuild. Yeah, and, and they're the still rebuilding. For it, so they have not stopped rebuilding since. Right. Now, so I didn't watch a whole lot of the Bulls, at least in the first three-peat. I didn't watch hardly any, at least none that I really remember being, you know, four or five years old. Now the second three P I'm getting eight, eight, nine, 10, you know, getting in there and everybody was Bulls fans, all the kids at school. And like, I had a Bulls jacket and I had uh, much starter like you have on right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I had, a I, I had a, you know, a Bulls hat or two from when they won a couple championships. But I do remember my dad, who again, not a basketball fan told me, this is the greatest person that will ever play this game that you will ever see. And so you actually, like you should watch this and you should pay attention to it, even if you don't understand what's going on. And I'm like, this guy is flying over everybody. And he, so I wish I was a little bit older, but I, but I appreciate it more now. And I certainly appreciated that the documentary. Yeah, just just on my end, I vividly remember his first game back against the Pacers on a Saturday uh, in in '95. That was nuts. Five. Uh, I, I remember most most of the last uh, or the second three P uh, staying up watching the Sonics. I remember the flu the food food poisoning game, not the flu game. Uh, and then you know remember specifically watching with my dad and you know him sitting there with the anxiety. It's like, dude, we got Michael Jordan. I specifically you know that that last play and you know being a Cubs fan definitely helped in in 2016. It's like yeah, you got the best team, you got the best players, you're going to win, sort of sort of thing. And and I would not you know as a Cubs fan, it definitely helped having the Bulls as a background a little bit. But I specifically remember that play where you know Jordan gets the layup, he comes down, doesn't follow his guy across the lane, comes around, strips strips the mailman who apparently doesn't deliver on Sundays. <laughs> you, you know, Jordan didn't give up the ball, and it, it was the perfect ending. To well, ultimately, it wasn't an ending, right? But uh, for that, for the last dance, it was it, it was really well put together. It really brought me back to you know being ten years old, and um, you know, perfect kind of uh, way to end our quarantining, or you know, it, it or not maybe not end it, but it was just something to do. And that month went by so quick. If you you know, the hype was, hey, here's this documentary first week. And those four weeks went by so quickly. Yeah. But always get, get me to Sunday so I can watch a little bit more of it and set it's over. Absolutely. And, and to even go so far as to say, I think it's going to be with now we have uh, sports leagues looking like they're going to potentially open or practice in some form or fashion with without fans. You know, Which is good news for football. Story. Right. But I think that this documentary, I think, helps them everybody's craziness of going months down without any organized sporting leagues of any kind. And so I think that it was something I, that everybody really came together to enjoy and celebrate. Uh, arguably, the one of, if not the best teams of all time, uh, and one of, if not the top basket player of all time. Is MJ your undisputed number one? Is there anybody close? So it depends on how you look at it. So, you know, a couple of years ago, I was thinking that LeBron was, but he doesn't, he did not have the Jordan killer instincts. So like from a basketball yeah. standpoint, you know, he's bigger, he's stronger, he's faster, uh, potentially a better shooter to a certain extent, but like, you know, the game is so much different now with the NBA of shooting threes. And yeah, well, don't worry, we'll get, we'll get to the fantasy football here in a couple of minutes. But the, you know, the game is so different. Jordan, of course, would good, would become a better shooter of three pointers if that's where the game is, which it is now. But the dude was just a, you know, he was a monster. You, you couldn't stop him. You, you thought you could. 
he would go lift weights all summer and he'd be like, I'm going to beat your ass. That Pistons. Oh my goodness, man. I couldn't believe that the earlier episodes were on the Pistons because that's, I couldn't, I mean, that's when, when people talk about the Bulls, everybody talks about how they had to get over the hump of beating the Pistons and then they finally did. And it was because of Michael Jordan's offseason training regimen. Um, yeah, I guess. I mean, the, the, the Pistons won back-to-back titles. Um, yeah. And, and they were beating the bull like they were so close to winning you know on the front end jordan retired in the middle and then you know ultimately could it, could they have come back um and won another one who really knows that they, they, you know they were getting to the end of it jordan was obviously upset about how that all ended and was like hey man suit shouldn't decide when this ends they gotta beat us um which i'm yeah. good to see for me i get just to it, it try is the mystique a little bit yeah true to me to try and put a little bit of a bow on this i think i would say mj for me is a clear cut number one over lebron and it's because mj didn't have to travel around from team to team trying to chase titles um and and so i think that that in and of itself is enough to make him regardless of how many points lebron ends up scoring in his career there's that and then there's also the fact that if mj was playing basketball for a stretch of eight years if he was playing and not in retirement his team won the championship so now could they have won seven eight in a row if he'd never retired in the interim or played again the following season after retiring the second time who knows you know what would that team have looked like but to me that argument's there and that's an argument that i don't think any other player will ever have other than anybody on that bulls team so yeah, I mean, hey, don't forget, Steve Kerr won four in a row. because Yes, he did on the Spurs. And won, so. <laughs> Good for Steve Kerr, man. Shout out to Steve Kerr. Um, all right, so now that we've uh, uh, been everybody's ear about how great the Bulls are, let's actually the get in, Bulls. Let's get into a little bit of football here. So, Alex, have you seen the latest and potentially greatest off-season hype video for a football team, and that being the Ben Roethlisberger haircut, I'm back <laughs> video that came out today. I, I did see it. Um, I, I want to point out that if you have not listened to our first episode, you should go listen to it because uh, somebody that's speaking right now might have pointed out that the Steelers were going to be way undervalued this year. Yeah. And I, I, I don't think I was wrong. Well, so much so that several other uh people that are you know much more experts in this field than we i think would ever even try to claim to be but yes experts in fantasy football don't have james connor in their even top 25 running backs and i mean if you if you're a believer in the steelers at all i think that he hands down is without a you know a shadow of a doubt a top twi- a top 25 running back and so i understand he had an awful season i understand that ben was hurt but to me that team went the way it did their offensive line still graded out as one of the top 10 in the league last year the year before that it was the number one graded offensive line per um pro football focus and so what you think that Ben's going to come back and they're going to be terrible again? I I mean, Mason Rudolph couldn't fall out of a boat and hit water last year. The only thing he was good at was starting fights with the Cleveland Browns. I I mean, to me, they are going to take a huge leap forward in performance. And if you're telling me that James Conner is not a top 25 running back, a Tomlin Tomlin was asked what his thoughts were of James Conner. And he said, you know, I've always envisioned myself as being a true lead back kind of guy. And um, while it's great to have another couple guys in there, like a Benny Snell, you know, being that support system and giving our true lead dog that, that rest that he needs, I have always believed in you know, you have one lead back and everybody else kind of fills in behind him. And if and if he's saying that now, 
given the awful season that they've had and ha not even really having in-person training of any kind, I am climbing aboard the James Conner train and I am climbing on Juju. And I'm I'm not, I don't know if I'm with you right now as far as where you like the, the rankings, I think where they'll end up. Yeah, yeah they're, but, they're a little high. But uh, to say that James Conner is not in the top 25 to me is blasphemy. Yeah, the, the only thing that I really have to add on the Steelers is you and me sit down every year. We, we talk about where we kind of rate these players out at. And we, and we had Juju Smith-Schuster at number four last year prior to the draft. Yeah, going into last year, we had him as our number four overall wide receiver. He had 1,400 right. some odd yards the year before with Antonio Brown. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. He, he had 111 catches in 1,400 yards. With like, Antonio Brown. Yeah, like the dude is an absolute beast. And just because he had a quarterback that can throw it a little bit farther than I can, and I haven't picked up a football in 15 don't, years. Don't, I was going to say, don't you dare call Mason Rudolph a quarterback. Oh. <laughs> don't insult the rest of those people. <laughs> and maybe I was calling myself a quarterback. I yes, yes. I mean, of course, of course. Yeah, but I mean, the, the dude, 1,100 or sorry, 111 catches, 1,400 yards, seven touchdowns. That That's a top 10 fantasy wide receiver. And just because he sucked last year doesn't mean he's going to suck this year. So no. He, I mean, he's got a real quarterback that throws for 4,500 plus yards. And that includes a lot of check, down, check downs to James Conner, who is a really good receiving back. They've got to get the ball. They're, they're, you know, their defense is really good, and they're going to score a ton of points because they're going to get turnovers in the red zone. Steelers, man. It's early. It's only May, but just give me all the Steelers. Absolutely. Last bit of a nugget. Talk, I have to talk myself out of it for the next three months, though. Just last, like, and this is going to be our nice little segment in the next piece here, but the last, bit, the last little nugget for anybody that's on the fence about the Steelers, they have the number two easiest schedule this season yep. and so their their opponents went far below 500 and so why would you not want the guys who underperformed last season get big ben back and they have a super easy schedule because of how many losses they had last year so to me it's just if you, if you get lucky you get a couple Steelers on your team at a decent value that round yep. out your team you're you're talking I think to me, postseason if everybody's healthy. So, but let's move on to the main course here. Uh, Bring it. The, the team with the number one easiest schedule this upcoming season, not to me, not that they needed it. <laughs> right. Yeah. How does that happen? How does a first place team have the easiest schedule in football? That doesn't make any sense. To me, it's it's when they line up the conferences, it's where everybody finished last year is who they play in the conferences based on the same ranking the next year. So like your first person, your number one team in the West plays the number one team in the East. Yeah, and that. yeah I don't know how this happens. I have no idea other than their division, you know, the teams in their division didn't win a whole <laughs> lot of games. <laughs> uh, as we talk about the Steelers being great this year. Um, but that's a byproduct of it. And so now again, so we're talking about the Ravens. And so the, the main question that we want to deal with is should you draft Lamar Jackson? And we talked about this as should you spend a first pick, a first round pick on Lamar? We think in some drafts he's going to go in the first round. I think it's very realistic that he does. But then we also realized that he's not only going to go in the first round. It's very likely, I think, that he goes in the top half of the second or in the mid second in a lot of leagues, too. So, but yeah, I mean, to me, I think right, if you get him. You have that, to spend that, That's where Mahomes was going last year. And so Lamar's going to go in that same spot this year. Right. And, and is he worth it? So, Alex, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you take this out. To me, do you think that uh, do you think that you should draft Lamar Jackson and spend that uh, first two round pick on him? The answer is unequivocally yes. Oh, oh. OK, go on. It's, it's yes. So who was the number one, number one overall, who scored the most points in fantasy football last year? Uh, Lamar. He did. Okay, great. Glad I, glad I got that right. He, he was number one. So, I, I mean, if you want to end the conversation there and just like, and I know he's a quarterback and in the first round, it's always 
take a running back, take a wide receiver, take a running back, take a wide receiver, maybe take the top tight end. That, that hardly ever happens. Take a quarterback, never gets talked about. So here, here's why you should at least consider taking a running back. So, or sorry, taking a running back. Taking Lamar Jackson. No, 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 maybe I didn't misspeak because Lamar Jackson, I know he pokes fun at being a running back, but I mean, the dude is a running back. He had 1,200 rushing yards last year. There were only five running backs that had more yards than him last year. That's insane. That's insane. Five. There was only five. So if you're talking about taking a running back in the first round, Lamar Jackson technically fits taking a running back in the first round. And he happens to have the ball in his hands every single play, and he can throw. Did I mention that he led the league in touchdown passes last year? Because he did. He led the freaking league in touchdown passes. With how many? Do you have any? What's that? With how many touchdowns? Do you know? Yeah, he had 36 passing touchdowns. Okay, so but to me, that's... Fantastic, phenomenal number of touchdown passes. However, how many did Pat Mahomes throw the year before? Was it 55? Uh, sure. Let's say yes. But we looked we looked this up. So in, in our we did. right in in, our, in the league that we play in, it's four points of passing touchdown, 25 points, uh, sorry, 25 yards from point passing. Uh, and then you get one point for 10 yards rushing, six for a rushing touchdown. They were within like two points of each other. Yeah. Right? And and so <clears throat> Lamar had 36. Yeah, right. I mean, Lamar had 36 passing touchdowns. Mahomes had 55. You know, I was gonna but, say they're but he he made it all up with 1,200 rushing yards. Well, to me, that's not even the argument. To me, the argument is that he made it up with 1,200 rushing yards. It's Mahomes had to throw 20 more touchdowns to get there. That's the <laughs> argument. That's and insane. Because to me, to me, and I'm going to argue the other side of this, but I'm I'm gonna help. I'm gonna argue your side for a minute here. Please do. It's the right side. Those 1,200 yards are not going anywhere. They might go down, but if they go down to what? 900? So what? <laughs> he's still, <laughs> he's so still the number one freaking player in fantasy football. So I, I get it. And, and not only that, but uh, I'm gonna give a shout out to Ross Miller here, a good friend of mine. Um, we He's been doing a lot of work with uh, AI uh, pre predicted and, uh, and AI learning. And so he, He's found that the single greatest stat or the, the single stat that's the greatest predictor of a, a running back's success the following season and how many yards they might rush for is how many yards they ran for the previous season. Not playing time, not team wins, not number of rushing attempts, not even their average per rush attempt. It's just how many yards, gross yards, did they run for the previous season, and that makes them more likely to repeat the next. Well, if you look at this offense, nothing's changed. They added J.K. Dobbins, who's just another threat on offense, but you got Hollywood, who's a year further into the league, I mean, Andrews could be the T, the tight end one this year. I think that, I mean, I, I don't think those yards are going anywhere. I think Lamar's easily rushing for close to a thousand, if not setting the record again at 1200. If he had to and, play, think about all the games even, that he got out of early because they were up 30 yeah. points. Like yeah, he, he, he didn't play week 17 last year. Exactly. Right, so so statistics are going to be skewed one way or the other. But that you know, if he actually had to play that week, he would have even more yards. He'd probably have more touchdown pass. You know, like the dude was an absolute beast. And to your point, even if he only rushes only rushes right. for nine yards this year, that was still there was only sixteen running backs that did that last year. One of them being Sony Michelle, and he's terrible. Yeah. So, and so, do you want him to be able to throw touchdowns at the same time? Yes, of course you do. So like, to, and you know, just from my standpoint, if you're going to, you, you want to have fun playing fantasy football. Like you want to root for the best players, the most exciting players. Lamar Jackson's on prime time five weeks next year. Including, oh. Yeah, including three in a row. Week 12, 
uh, Thanksgiving night against the, uh, against the Steelers, week 13 against Dallas, which will be fantastic. Week 14, Monday Night Football at Cleveland. That's your playoffs Monday. Ooh. You know what you're going to need to advance if, if you're playing that week. And you get to root for Lamar Jackson to just go off and destroy people. That's just uh, you get the pleasure of watching him destroy the Browns. Yeah, that's, <laughs> right. That's just genuinely fun. And if you like do it all, he's the, he's the M, you know he's the MVP of the league. All these players are lining up to have him sign autographs at the end of the year. And I know we just talked about Michael Jordan, but like it's early. The dude has already changed the game of football, and he's only been in the league for a couple of years. So, I, yes, I, I love personally taking quarterbacks early because they always fall further than they should. And Lamar Jackson specifically last year, if, if you had him on your team, compared to quarterback number two, he scored six more points a week than the second closest guy that that's more than McCaffrey was to, to RB two. Like if you can get the best player at the position and now don't get me wrong, Patrick Mahomes this year, he's going to be really good again. Their offense is going to be unbelievable. Yeah. But will he's going to have to throw 50 touchdowns to get close right. to Lamar. Right. Will, will there be that gap between one and two? I don't think so. I, I think Mahomes and, and Lamar are going to be very closely drafted um, in, you know, somewhere in the second round probably but to me it's worth it especially depending on on how your system is just take them have fun with it and like you can get running backs and wide receivers later you take one basically every round for like 10 rounds between round three and round 13. so just take the best quarterback take them early and just enjoy it it's so fun to root for all right here we go this is why you should not Buzzkill time. Not. Nah. Ladies and gentlemen, Buzzkill nah. Jason. Draft. <laughs> Lamar. So, I'm going to argue the opposite side of this for a minute. Alex, do you know where, if you started the quarterback who faced the Miami Dolphins every week, where that quarterback would have finished? in fantasy football scoring. So the Miami Dolphins defense was actually better than you think they were last year. Okay. So where would you guess if you could start the quarterback facing the Dolphins every week, where do you think that that quarterback finished in scoring? Uh, Let's go QB 10. Okay. What if I told you it was quarterback three? And and if you threw out Brian Hoyer and the Colts low score of six points that goes up from quarterback three to quarterback two. And and the uh, the weekly point average is less than five points less than Lamar Jackson. It's still five points. I mean, it's, it's still it's, OK. It's five points, but you get a first or second round pick. Who's probably going to get hurt anyway? If you can't, you cannot miss on your first or second round picks. You just can't. Wait, miss. wait, wait. So a first or second round pick is going to get hurt, but Lamar Jackson rushing for 1,200 yards won't get hurt? That's exactly correct. Okay. I was just making sure we were talking. <laughs> but Jimmy Garoppolo, who went outside, who pushed his shoulder down to fight for one more yard going out of bounds, tears his You shouldn't have done that. You got to run out of bounds. You got to run out of bounds, bounds but Lamar's knows. not getting hurt. All no, right. So, of course so, not. But this is my point. The amalgamation of quarterbacks facing the Miami Dolphins were quite I don't even know what that means. Can you can you speak (laughs) please? The 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 mixed bag of quarterbacks. And it includes it includes sounds sounds like a sacco. Yeah, exactly. So Josh Allen put up 34 points against the Dolphins. Andy Dalton lit him up for 34 points in the same week that uh, Lamar Jackson put up 29. So, hey, on average, you're down five points, but that week, yeah, but, 16 championship, but Andy Dalton outscored him. Hold on, though. The, the Miami Dolphins were being talked about as a historically bad team through, like, six weeks. Well, they were, it was shootouts. Ryan Fitzmagic was keeping them in games. They weren't good. Come on, Patrick Laird was running up the middle for 1.5 yards. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fine. Fine, you want the Dolphins, I'll give you the Dolphins. 
Guess where quarterbacks facing the New York Giants finished last year? QB six. QB eight. However, if you cut out the low score put up by uh, Case Keenum and Dwayne Haskins of zero points, <laughs> it goes up from QB eight to QB two again. Okay, well, if if, if hold my, on, hold on, I got one more. My uncle, so that doesn't matter. One more. Quarterbacks facing the Detroit Lions, the number one uh, defense that was, uh, excuse me, the, the, the defense that gave up the most passing yards on the season last year. <clears throat> As a group, quarterbacks finished. If you started the quarterback who faced the Detroit Lions every week, you would have had the number seven overall quarterback in fantasy. And again, just to show and, and illustrate how terrible the Redskins were, if you throw out their low score of Dwayne Haskins putting up five points against them, it goes up again to quarterback number two. So my thing is, is I'm trying to show that quarterback to me, if you got a couple good average to above average guys and you can play matchups, then it, to me, it's not worth spending the first or second round pick to get the Lamar Jackson on your team that you can play week in, week out. And I understand that there's that certain comfortability with not having to worry about how many points your quarterback's gonna put up. And I'll give you that. Lamar offers you that. Pat Mahomes offers you that. Aaron Rodgers used to for a while. I had a down season last yeah, year, but there's more. those guys. And I'm not advocating for those guys because to me, I'd rather get like Mike Evans or Juju Smith-Schuster this year or somebody else where I'm not blowing all of my, my draft equity on a quarterback. It's just not, I mean, if, if what I would say is this, and, I'm, and this is why I argued that your side for you. If there was ever a quarterback that I would, it would be Lamar Jackson. It would not be Pat Mahomes because throwing 55 touchdowns to me is insane. I think that that offense in Baltimore is predicated on Lamar being able to run and he will run and he will also throw and he will be a very great thrower and probably throw for close to 30 touchdowns, if not more again. I'm just saying that those yards are built in and pad what he's going to do. So if there was a guy that you would consider spending that capital on, I would much rather put it on Lamar than on Pat Mahomes. Um, yeah, I get that. But for me, I would probably steer clear and try and pick up like Aaron Rodgers in the sixth or Kyler Murray in the fourth or fifth or something like that. Who, oh, you know, I love me some Kyler Murray. I do. I, and I think he's I, maybe I think you're talking him into being one of uh, both of our dark horses for this season. So, yeah, he's not even a dark horse anymore. He's just really good and has one of the best first receivers ever. Sure. Just, just real quick to, to look at ADP uh, when, it, when it comes to average draft position of, of where Lamar Jackson's at. Uh, you know, you're, you're, let's start at seven. So you got Zeke, Tyree Kill, Josh Jacobs, Joe Mixon to kind of end, you know, so, you know. Joe, I would take any of them. Yeah. What's that? I would take any of them over Lamar. Okay, so, so Lamar's next. And then it's Julio, Derrick Henry, Nick Chubb, Ooh. Aaron Jones, Chris Godwin, Mike Evans, Kelsey, Fournette, and then Mahomes. So, so to me, I would like I I would have taken Derrick Henry over Joe Mixon. So I would still take right. I would still take yeah. Derrick Henry. Um, yeah. and, right. and I would and, and Nick Nick Chubb had the second most rushing yards in football last year, and, and is still down there. You know, so. and what I talked about earlier, previous right. years rushing yards predicting future year success, rushing yards of the. the um, rushing yards of the previous year are the biggest uh, determining factor of that. And so, with, great with, point. With, with an actual offensive coach instead of soup, you know, Freddie Soup Kitchens, who uh, <laughs> yeah. has no idea what he's doing. Do, so, are like, you worried about Kareem Hunt at all, though? Because, like, to me, that gives me pause, and I'm probably going to miss on Chubb completely because. Yeah, because, yeah. I'm I mean, not going to be. Fall. I mean, yeah, once, once Kareem Hunt was there. It just wasn't the same, especially the receiving yards weren't there because because Hunt was getting everything. 
So there, there's a lot of kind of mishmash in there. And so for me, that almost kind of supports where I'm going is you can't miss. You, you can't miss. True. That. You cannot Don't. miss in your first, I think, four rounds. You really, they're the most and, successful teams that are going to make the playoffs. They did not miss in their first four rounds. They right, certainly didn't miss in their first two. And yeah, so I guess if really, you're looking at it that way at Lamar. Yep. It's really easy to miss in the first four rounds. And so, I mean, injuries aside, it's hard to get more concrete because of the rushing yards with Lamar. And that's why I would advocate taking him. He's just, he's really good. He's going to give you a consistent point total every week from the quarterback position. Even if he throws a couple picks, he's still going to have a rushing touchdown to counteract that. And then you still get all of his passing yards. You still get all of his rushing yards. It just, it makes a lot of sense because of the rushing yards. It's not because he's a great quarterback, although apparently he is. In my eyes, I don't know how good of a passer he is, but he proved last year with 36 touchdowns. Bro, 36 touchdowns, you gotta be knowing what you're doing. Yeah, you're pretty good, right? (laughs) So, I mean, 36 touchdowns, six interceptions, 1,200 yards. There was 12 quarterback, or sorry, 12 running backs that had more rushing touchdowns than him last year. There's 12 running backs that had more rushing touchdowns. Mm-hmm. The dude is a top 15 running back who also plays quarterback. And for that reason, that's why I think you can justify him taking him back. So, so I guess I'm going to bend it back a little bit on you. So you're talking about you can't miss in your first two rounds. Yep. And that that's why you should take Lamar because he's basically a sure thing. Maybe not to repeat to the at the high level that he played last year, but at a high level, high, very high level nonetheless. If you take Lamar, then that means, I mean, you have to start two running backs, two wide receivers, and a flex. So you're saying you got to start five guys. If you normally traditionally draft, say, three running backs and two wide receivers, if you wedge Lamar in there, and that means that you're going a whole 12, however many picks more between rounds for it to loop back. And that's another guy you got to start. And you're talking about mitigating risk. And that's a whole round later on some guy I have to put in my lineup every week yep. you know, versus being able to get a decent quarterback as you're getting closer to the double digit rounds or after the double digit rounds, if you want to take a flyer on a guy or, you know, play matchups and, and do that and, and go that route and potentially end up with the uh, the quarterback too anyway, because again, nobody, if you're, if you don't have to me, I guess my, my thought on it is unless you have a top half of the league quarterback in terms of fantasy football outfit, not, or output, not performance or skill, but if you don't have a top six performing quarterback in fantasy points, then to me, you're playing matchups anyway. Like, I'm not going to run Phil Rivers out there in a bad matchup just because he's quarterback seven or, or, you know, I've never been that person. And if you are, then crap, I hope I get to play you every week in, in, in head to head. So... Here, and I I don't know how quickly you want to pivot off this, but I I will say that coming from you is is somewhat entertaining because I know how you like to operate your team. We go through your draft every year, and I think you might keep maybe like four people that you draft on your team is is on your team at the end of the year. Yeah. So for me, if, if I can take somebody that's guaranteed to be top three at their position, when you're going to drop well over half your roster anyway and replace them with different wide receivers and running backs or tight ends and play matchups all over the place, which is something that I think we both take great pride in doing, I think that actually gives you more of a reason to take somebody that's going to be... You know you're going to use... Right, you know you're going to use them. You're never going to drop them. You're always going to have them locked in. You, I, we always talk about, hey, what is the matchup in the playoffs? You talked about it last week. It's Cleveland. It's the Jaguars. It's the Giants. Eighth most fantasy points to running backs. Second most points to running backs. Sixteenth most points to running backs. In order. 
Oh, by the way, I guess he's a quarterback. Let's talk about those. 12th most points to quarterbacks, 14th most points to running or to quarterbacks, third most points to quarterbacks. Like he's going to go off in the playoffs. So if you can lock that in right now, take what your strength is and just, you know, pick up backup running backs because people get hurt. Find the wide receivers that end up doing better, like the McLarens of the world or whatever. There's always value those first couple of weeks that you can find guys and plug and play. And, you know, they end up being, you know, at least flex type options and just let Lamar do his thing. There's no reason why that doesn't make sense for somebody that plays fantasy football like you, where you're constantly adding and dropping players and trying to figure, you know, basically brain trust this great team of of like people that you didn't think were going to be good and just let Lamar do his thing and figure out the rest later. Absolutely. That, you know, that makes a ton of sense to me. To, and, it, and it does. I mean, I'm a firm believer that your draft is is just who who everyone thinks is the best You're player. trying to find assets that, that trade. Yeah. Yeah. But there's there's so much recency in fantasy football, and I think deservedly so. Um, if your team or your players are not performing, and there's somebody on waivers who is performing, then you need to go and get that player. And we will talk about Fab uh, free agent auction bidding, which is something that our league does, and we'll be providing advice on that. I hope at least this upcoming season, if we don't cancel ourselves. <laughs> if we don't cancel ourselves. If we don't cancel ourselves now. To me, the draft, again, it just sets up like the skeleton. Hopefully you get a few assets that you can use throughout the league or throughout the league year. Um, but you have to be constantly on the lookout for waiver wires. Like I've I've been lucky enough to get guys like George Kittle on my team. I had Devontae Parker last year. I had McLaurin off of waivers. Like I've gotten, I've I'm a very active waivers guy to a fault because when it's playoff time, I don't usually have a whole lot of fab left. Um, and, and you know, certainly to a fault, if somebody, if one, heaven forbid, one of my own guys goes down in the playoffs, sometimes I'm uh, not able to get the, the the handcuff or running back, the, the backup on my squad. But I think another piece of advice is, as you're getting closer to the playoffs, you start cutting the end of your bench the guys that you think might be something and you start backing up your stars, which I think yep. is also another valuable piece of advice. So that way that doesn't happen to you. But, you know, the guys like the Tony Pollard's of the world that are being drafted out of the gate and held for 16 weeks and don't do anything, that's a little bit different. I'd maybe only want to pick them up like week 10, 11 for the playoffs and go from there. But, you know. Yeah, like drive, right, like dropping Dak Prescott like you did last year. Who ended Ooh. up being Oh, out! I did. I did. He, to me, I the quarterbacks the are important, right? I didn't think that Dak was that great, honestly, going into last year. But I saw his schedule, and I was like, "This to me is a streaming quality quarterback who I think, on skill, is probably in the top fifteen in the league, and with talent, can have extremely good games." And I also thought he could potentially rush for touchdowns, which is appealing to me because they're worth two points more in our league. Um, and so, and then I looked at his first month, I'm like, I don't even need another quarterback that I need to pair with him to stream. I can just leave Dak in for a month. And then the road gets a little bit more difficult as he goes into conference play, but turns out some of their conference people who I thought were gonna be good, weren't very good last year. And I ended up prematurely yeah. dropping, what, the top three quarterbacks, so. And yeah, you, just, you win just, some, you lose some, yeah, <laughs> I, I, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, I, I just want to throw one more thing about Lamar in. So, you know, it does depend on your scoring system, right? If you have four points for a passing touchdown, six points for a rushing touchdown, that, that makes a significant difference over six points for a passing touchdown and six points for a rushing touchdown. Now with Lamar, it there's a 20 point difference for the year. So in, instead of there being a six point difference, there was only a, a f like four and a half point difference a week. Really? I mean, the, the dude is still just a, an absolute machine over, over QB two. 
with, of course, in the assumption that Mahomes kind of ascends back to where he was, at least partially. Well, that means, to me, that means if you get the quarterback that throws 50 touchdowns and you're scoring six points a touchdown, it doesn't really matter what Lamar is doing. He's head and shoulders above Lamar at that point. But the D, the default scoring for ESPN is four points for passing touchdowns. So to me, yep. that, again, is going to weigh in Lamar's favor. And if that's your league, I think that... Uh, you could evaluate drafting him early. Um, all right, so let's have ha, have I talked you into taking Lamar early? Well, that's what I want to get into. Would either of us actually? It doesn't matter the ADPs because you you and I understand the qual- the caliber of players I think that are available in the second round at the other positions. And, you know, if you're t- potentially talking your number one tight end still being there when you're considering Lamar. Yep. Alex, would you take Lamar in the first two rounds? Yes, absolutely. If, if, if I'm at the end of the second round, it's an absolute slam dunk. Like yeah. the very end or in like the final four, the final three? Yeah, no, 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 yeah final four. Yes. Yeah, because. Okay. So if if you're at the end of the second round and you obviously have one of the top four running backs, probably you can take Lamar and then you can take a tight end on the on the wraparound. Theoretically. Oh, so you don't get a receiver to the fourth. Potentially. My ears are bleeding. It it just depends on who's falling. Yeah. It's it's what the best value is. And and to your point of, of what you mentioned before, you have to have a thought on every player. You have to have them tiered. You have to know what you're going to do. You have to do all these mock drafts in advance to know, hey, if I do this in the first, so, you know, you do a mock draft where you're you're picking fourth in a 12-person league, you take the running back, you take Lamar, you take the tight end, and then you can you can see who you would who would fall to you in rounds four through forever. Right. If, if you don't if you don't play out the scenarios, you're not going to know the answer ahead of time. And then you're just going to be like, oh, what did I do? If you actually go in with a strategy of taking Lamar in the second round and you know what you're, what's going to, so if you're in the back half of the first round, the running back value isn't there and you're taking Tyreek Hill or you're taking whoever. Yeah, Julio Devante. Right. Like you, you, if you're going to take one of them and then you're going to take Lamar in the second, then you might. Like your those third and fourth picks are going to be pretty close together. You're going to be able to get a running back, wide receiver there, a running back, running back, and then you're still probably fine. So it's like you, you just have to plan for it. If you're going to do it, you have to plan and know who's going to be there on the back side of things to take and have a strategy. If you're going to go into a blind one, why are you listening to this? But, <laughs> like, Turn it off. You're drunk. Yeah. Go home. <laughs> right, but if like. Just if you have a strategy of doing it and then you actually see it through by the time you're sitting around seven, eight and you're looking around and you have Lamar freaking Jackson on your team who is just going to go off and you can bank on him going off and then you can you can just fill in around it. It's a very comforting feeling. I'm not saying you can't do that with other players, but with him getting those rushing yards all the time, it's just an easy plug and play you just set it you forget it thank you infomercials and you just it just you just let it ride and you fill in in the back half and if you can pick up backup running backs that become starters like miles sanders of the world or whoever from last year you're going you're going to be really good because he's really good yeah yeah i guess there's a real big part of me that is considering it this year and wow there is and that's not and that's wow. not and, and 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 i'll tell you why if if lamar had 200 300 rushing yards and threw 50 60 touchdowns i'm not touching lamar this year to me there's one quarterback every year that breaks out and throws for 50 or close to 50 touchdowns and you know what if you're the analyst that can predict who that is every year then you should be in vegas making a lot of money um that's not me that's not something that i 
don't think I'll ever be lucky enough to get right. Um, but that's not Lamar either. And I don't think Lamar is ever going to throw for 50 touchdowns. I don't think he's ever going to really. I think if he throws 40, he's going to be having a heck of a year. And, and yeah, I don't. He had and if he does last year. Well, if he if he throws for 40, I don't think it's in the next two to three years while he's as mobile as he is right now. Um, I mean, he he makes a check, couple checks. If not, I mean, he knows how lethal he is. He knows he can make a couple jukes, hit a spin move, and be gone for 80 yards and a touchdown. So, at the same time, now what I think, what I do think is, I think those yards are kind of baked in to the Lamar Jackson experience, if you will. He's like lasagna, man. G- give me the <sighs> Lamar Lamarzania. Yeah, Lamarzania. Lasagna. All right, Lasagna. What is that, dependable? <laughs> Can't wait till we talk about what kind of food we are, but that's for another podcast, maybe. Uh-huh. But if it so again, if if he wasn't if he wasn't rushing for over a thousand yards, if he wasn't setting the all-time rushing record for a quarterback, and he was just throwing the throwing touchdowns, I don't want any part of it. Because you can't predict that. But the 1,200 yards to me are extremely repeatable. We already talked about how the greatest predictor for a running back success uh, this in, in an upcoming season is his uh, yardage output the previous season, and Lamar put up 1,200 yards. So if that's the case, and I didn't see anything that happened in that that draft that made me say, oh man, I don't think Lamar's going to be running a whole lot this year. Maybe as somebody, as somebody who is aggressive on waivers and, you know, can get, you know, the high performers the first couple of weeks and maybe they turn into something, maybe they don't, then maybe you're not worried about filling holes or maybe you don't want to run around worrying about who's going to start at you, start for you a quarterback week in and week out. And you know what? If uh, if you don't have to worry about that, then that means that you get to save a bench space. That otherwise you're holding quarterbacks based on their matchups the upcoming weeks, yep. and instead that's a guy that you think could potentially break out if somebody goes down or just isn't getting enough touches right now. But those touches could evolve. So, yep, I could see I see the argument. I definitely think that Lamar is the exception to. The quarterback rule, I think as long as he is performing like this, I think he will be the only quarterback, unless there's a dearth of them that come in, there's a sudden influx of Lamar Jacksons that come into the league and have the same output. And I know that your dark horse, Kyler Murray, could maybe kind of be that way, but unless there's another couple guys that come in, I don't think that there's anybody that I would say that that I would be willing to pick in the first two rounds. If there was somebody, it would be Lamar. And it really depends on who else is available. Like when I was picking in the second round this past season, I missed out on everybody that I potentially wanted or was hoping would fall in the second round. Fournette was gone. I missed out on Dalvin Cook at, at the wrap. And I'm sitting there and I took Gurley. And I tell you what, if I could have had Lamar Jackson on my team instead of Todd freaking Gurley last year, I would have been a much happier man. So Sure. Yeah, just take take somebody that you're going to be happy watching. You're going to be rooting for him. He's a fun guy to root for. He's exciting. He's entertaining. That's, that's really what fantasy needs to be about. And I feel like we get yeah. away from that sometimes. It's like, take, take the most exciting person and just have fun and and root for him and yeah. especially prime time all the time and he's a young young good looking dude that's just like yeah and as somebody that uh that had lamar or, or, or that went up against the ravens in uh in the playoffs last year and actually lost to mark ingram i can attest to how fun they are to watch and terrifying if the other team has them and you don't, so. Right, I, right. If, if you were to name one person that you don't want to go against, I mean, it's Christian McCaffrey. And I mean, behind that, if you see that person on that team, it's probably Lamar Jackson because yeah. you, he's just going to score 30 points. It's, yeah. 
And it's rough. And that's the thing. Like that team, that that team with the number one pick, if they get Christian McCaffrey in the first, Lamar falls to them in the second, and then they take Mark Andrews to pair with Lamar or Kelsey or somebody to go with them, you're like, oh my God. And maybe it doesn't matter who else they have at the other positions, because those three guys can put up 90 points by themselves. Yeah. So absolutely get it. Um with that, Alex, I'm going to give you the final thought on this. So you are you considering it or are you staying away from Lamar? Is there anybody else that you would consider in the first two rounds or who is your next quarterback after Lamar this year? It's it's definitely Mahomes. I, I took Mahomes in the, you know, the wraparound of the third round and it's all teamer last year. I, I, I think he's going to be back to being superhuman be, with an Andy Reid offense. We, we talked about this a little bit last week, but yeah. It's just he's so good. It's it's those two. There's a tier there, and then the next two. It's it's going to be Prescott and, and Murray for me. Um, and I mean, I love me some Kyler Murray, man. He had 544 rushing yards last year. Year one of a brand brand new offense, and and you add DeAndre Hopkins to that with Hall of Famer Fitzgerald, um, Ken, Kenyon Drake. That that offense is going to be explosive, and just another one that's going to be really fun to root for and watch. So, th- those are really. I'm I'm trying to like get back to just who's going to be fun to watch. You know, you watch Joe Mixon last year. You don't want you don't want to watch on a weekly basis. You see Sony. <laughs> You, you see Sony Michelle, and yeah, he might be actually be pretty good this year because he wasn't very good last year. And no, so, God, no! Don't draft oh. Sony Michelle, anyone, please. No, just hold. I'll have more of that later, eventually. But he, he's one of those guys like you don't enjoy watching him. So why are you taking him? Although if the value's there, you might want to. But you know, he was really good a couple years ago, but he wasn't wasn't last year. So you, you just kind of gotta find the value and where it's at, and. Just win, baby. As right. Well, that's the thing, and I guess I want to clarify a couple of things. And we even dealt with this a little bit on our social media. When we say avoid this person, avoid the team, don't trap this person. What we mean is, we don't think that their ADPs, their average draft position, is going to return the value that you spent to get them on your team, and that that value is much better spent on somebody else that you can get in the same area. And so to me, there's not a lot of guys that are gonna be returning ADP like a Lamar Jackson has the potential to in the top two rounds. I think I'm gonna, I'll plant my flag now. I don't think Dak is gonna be a top five quarterback by any stretch of the imagination. I pity the the people that draft him at numbers in, at the, as the third quarterback taken. I don't know. I just, I'm not a, I'm not a Dak believer, but that's my personal thing. Um, for me, the top yeah, two but- are uh, Lamar and Mahomes, and those would be the only two guys I would consider in the top three rounds. And, and if you don't get either one of the two, to kind of to your point, just wait, figure out the streaming options later. Maybe Jared Goff has a better year. Yeah. You, you can always find a quarterback late, but I'm saying from a, like, if you can get those top two guys early, it, it does have value. Yeah. I mean, really, all you need to get is one of those top two guys, and then you hit on one waiver guy that's your flex that you were struggling for and hey your waiver issue is gone or your flex issue is gone or your wide receiver two issue is gone that you had because you waited so long to pick them so yeah it's really and, and to even circle back further what we said before when you talked about how i constantly drop people to me again just to really hammer this home the draft sets, sets up the basis for your team. You have to be on waivers. You have to be active. The draft is not your playoff team. And if it is, then I think you're very lucky that you got to the playoffs if you're starting the same eight or nine guys. So, Yeah, and, and sometimes it works to, to your detriment because I got stuck with a team that I drafted last year and I couldn't drop anybody because you... Yeah. Like you, you kind of get stuck sometimes. You have to make make tough decisions. But if if you have you know if you can guarantee yourself a quarterback and you don't have to keep another one on your roster, that frees up a little bit of roster availability 
for you to kind of play around with those last two, three roster spots on your on your team and try to make a, a championship push. So uh, yeah. it's a fun, fun kind of debate, and, and I've enjoyed this. I, I feel like I kind of talked to you, too, which I was a little surprised about. Did I talk uh, you out of it? Did the, did the other teams matter at all? The, the quarterback twos against any of those defenses? Uh, I mean, to a certain extent, sure, but that's not old. That's not super surprising, but you can't just start those guys week over week because you're going to have to, if, like, you're going to have to find a different team. And, and you brought up, what it was the Detroit Lions? Yeah. Like, I'm not going to want to start Nick Foles against the Detroit Lions <laughs> in a week. Like, like, so it's like, it's like that, that sounds really good until you're like, I just start who to get that matchup? Right, right. And, you know, and it's one of those things where it's like, do you really want to go into week with quarterbacks at the top of those matchups? Are Nick Foles cast? versus Lamar Jackson? Right. And so you're, you're looking like head to head and you're like, Oh no. I thought the same thing until oh. Ryan Fitzpatrick put a 40 on me in the championship and I lost by like 10 points. So I'm just yeah, saying that, those teams are out there and they ma- win. That was a matchup base, right? I mean, that- and that was purely matchup. So, yep. all right. With that, everybody, thank you for listening. This is episode two of the Fantasy Football Sackos. We appreciate you all for taking the time to, uh, to join us. And... Um, I will please, I will spend this time to please beg all of you to follow us on all of our social media. We are at do it. FF Sackos. Alex said, do it. We are at do the it. FF yeah, Sackos on every platform. We're yeah, talking the, the fantasy first football per- topical The humor. first person to tweet at us that I was correct in the argument, I will personally send a check for for a dollar. Oh! Right, All right, the first person to say, that says that Jason won the argument and that you should not spend the draft capital on Lamar Jackson, I will send a dollar and a penny because I am not <laughs> to be outdone. <laughs> All right, and with that, thank you. Have a good night. Peace. Peace.